magic wood Here in the secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun The magic secret kindergarten on the revolution Welcome back to The Secret Kindergarten. I'm your host, Gino. And right now, we're going to play some music by Nancy Stewart of nancymusic.com. There was a tree all in the wood The prettiest little tree This one's orange and rabbits like to eat it. 
it's a carrot. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one grows under the ground, and when it's ready to eat, you have to dig it up. It's a potato. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. You might call this one little trees because it looks like little trees. It's broccoli. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's long and yellow, and sometimes we pop it. It's corn. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's round and green, and we call it a head. It's a head of lettuce. story I would like to play for you and this one's called the girl monkey and the string of pearls I wonder what lesson we're gonna learn from the girl monkey the girl monkey and the string of pearls one day the king went for a long walk in the woods when he came back to his own garden he sent for his family to come down to the lake for a swim. When they were all ready to go into the water, the queen and her ladies left their jewels in charge of the servants and then went down into the lake. As the queen put her string of pearls away in a box, she was watched by a girl monkey who sat in the branches of a tree nearby. This girl monkey wanted to get the queen's string of pearls, so she sat still and watched hoping that the servant in charge of the pearls would go to sleep. At first the servant kept her eyes on the jewel box, but by and by she began to nod, and then she fell fast asleep. As soon as the monkey saw this, quick as the wind she jumped down, opened the box, picked up the string of pearls, and quick as the wind she was up in the tree again, holding the pearls very carefully. She put the string of pearls on, and then... For fear the guards in the garden would see the pearls, the monkey hid them in a hole in the tree. Then she sat nearby, looking as if nothing had happened. By and by the servant awoke. She looked in the box, and finding that the string of pearls was not there, she cried, A man has run off with the queen's string of pearls! Up ran the guards from every side. The servant said, I sat right here beside the box where the queen put her string of pearls. I did not move from the place. But the day is hot and I was tired. I must have fallen asleep. The pearls were gone when I awoke. The guards told the king that the pearls were gone. Find the man who stole the pearls, said the king. Away went the guards, looking high and low for the thief. After the king had gone, the chief guard said to himself, There is something strange here. These pearls, thought he, were lost in the garden. There was a strong guard at the gates, so that no one from the outside could get into the garden. On the other hand, there are hundreds of monkeys here in the garden. Perhaps one of the girl monkeys took the string of pearls. Then the chief guard thought of a trick that would tell whether a girl monkey had taken the pearls. So he bought a number of strings of bright-colored glass beads. 
After dark that night, the guards hung the string of glass beads here and there on the low bushes in the garden. When the monkeys saw the strings of bright colored beads the next morning, each monkey ran for a string. But the girl monkey who had taken the queen's string of pearls did not come down. She sat near the hole where she had hidden the pearls. The other monkeys were greatly pleased with their strings of beads. They chattered to one another about them. It is too bad you did not get one, they said to her as she sat quietly, saying nothing. At last she could stand it no longer. She put on the queen's string of pearls and came down, saying proudly, You have only strings of glass beads. See my string of pearls? Then the chief of the guards, who had been hiding nearby, caught the girl monkey. He took her at once to the king. It was this girl monkey, your majesty, who took the pearls. The king was glad enough to get the pearls, but he asked the chief guard how he had found out who took them. The chief guard told the king that he knew no one could have come into the garden, and so he thought they must have been taken by one of the monkeys in the garden. Then he told the king about the trick he had played with the beads. You are the right man in the right place, said the king, and he thanked the chief of guards over and over again. What a naughty monkey! That's why you shouldn't bother stealing. Because if you steal something, someone's going to see it, and then, <laughs> and then you're caught. <laughs> so why steal it? <laughs> At least that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> And it's that special time of the day where we talk about a lesson from the eternal verities and it's for children would you believe this story which is a lesson is called the test William Clark hated to work. I know the feeling. <laughs> and he never worked with a will. Yet he never could understand why he wasn't rich. Why he had to earn his daily bread instead of riding around the country in his own flash car. He came to almost hating anyone who had more ease than he had. Never thinking that his beautiful, strong body and nimble fingers were riches enough for a young man. And never thinking either that he showed each day how incapable he was of using riches wisely by the way he ignored the physical riches he already possessed. William worked, or pretended to work, in the foundry near his home. He hated his job, as he had all, as he had all other jobs before it, and was always the last to arrive in the morning, and the first to reach for his coat at night. Now, Thinking that he hated working, not only made that work harder to do, but also harder to do well. William finally grew to have almost a love for shirking. He felt that somehow he was making the balance right if he did things as badly as he dared. To spite the world because he was poor. Never did he dream that his own thoughts were the reason for his poor pay envelope. One morning, when he arrived at the shop, he found all the men stirring and working with unusual rush. The foreman came out of the office and called them all together, saying that the next week the new machinery would be unloaded, and the great magnet of which everybody had been talking, would be tested. 
So men, get busy now. The manager and mayor will be at the testing and it will be a half holiday. We must get all these orders out of the way before then to make room for the new stuff. William turned away with a curl of the lip. New magnet, he muttered, as if that folly was all they could spend their money on. He went back to his work, however, with an appearance of willingness. The foreman was not too patient and he had already spoken to William more than once of his poor work. He was coming up to him now. Look here, Bill, he said. I want two dozen of those extra fine castings made, number 8mm. You do the job and run it through. I'll leave it to you. Extra fine. A number one. Remember, no slip. You can do it. Then he went away thinking, I like the fellow. Perhaps this responsibility will put him on his mettle. William was flattered and pleased too by the confidence and praise of his superior. He felt a better spirit in his heart and he told himself he would do a good job. He would show them. Next day, he worked faithfully, and the next. The third day came, and the old don't-care-cheat-the-world feeling came back to poor William. He just couldn't do well another hour. He bungled, and he made mistakes. He took up the oar before it was at the degree of heat called for, and ran it into the moulds. I'm sick of this job he said. Guess I'll finish it quick, and then I'll get off earlier. He knew at that moment the castings would crack through their imperfections. But what did he care for? What did he care? For no one will ever know whose fault it was once they are shipped, he said. He cared neither for himself nor for the foreman. And least of all did he care that by his selfish thoughts he might be moulding the helpless lives in the iron to bring about calamity to hundreds of human beings. Finally his task was done, and even William feared when he saw the result of his blundering work. The next day was to be the day of the testing of the great magnet. They said, those who were venturing a fortune on its success, that this magnet would lift high in the air 40,000 pounds of solid iron, and that, too, without a chain. It would revolutionize the foundry work. It would lift hot metal without injury. It would load cars. And all would be done by one man pressing a button. In the midst of the interested chatter, William was anxious, a little anxiously wondering how to slide by the foreman's OK on the castings. The cars weren't there for loading, so they couldn't be shipped till the last of the week. He must hide them somewhere. When his eye fell on the slag pit, he thought, the very place. And for once in his life, he fell to work with vigour. Soon he had them covered with a layer of earth and slag and then left for home without a thought of worry. Next morning, the place was alive with interest. The manager, the mayor and all the leading citizens came to see the testing. William saw them in their smiling success and hated even the flower in the buttonhole of the mayor's coat. He had no heart to guess what grateful hand had put it there, nor what sacrifices had made the tired, anxious eyes above the flower. At last the great magnet was swung loose. Great in its power, it swept over the yard on its way to the mass of ore it was to pick up. But what is happening? The people rubbed their eyes, for as it swung over the slag pit, the earth broke away in clouds of dust, and up came William's hidden castings. A great laugh broke from the visitors, 
who, of course, did not understand. But the foreman was close enough to get the whole story in the twinkling of an eye, and William, poor William, slunk away. More than the magnet had been tested that day, but the magnet, not the man, had stood the test. William left that night for another city without even going back for his pay. Six months later, William's mother had a letter from him, from which she read to me with tears in her eyes. You know, mother, when I realised that that big magnet lifted 40,000 pounds of iron just because it liked it, I got the notion that I could lift my work better if I liked it. Honest, it's true. I am beginning to like my work now, and I do better, and do it easier and quicker. When I've made good for a whole year, I'm coming back to ask the boss for my old job. We are coming up to the end of the show! So it's time to get moving with the freeze game! Okay, let's go! When are we going to freeze? I got you! Ha <laughs> ha! Get moving! I'm dancing in my office chair. Ooh! You know, I wish someone else could press pause because then I could play better because I'm cheating. I know when it's going to stop. Oh, oh. Okay, let's keep going. You gotta dance like you mean it, and dance like you love it. Much like William needs to do with his job. Gotcha. Because doing things like you mean it, that's the secret to success. I gotcha. All right. And that's all we have time for. Thanks for tuning into The Secret Kindergarten. Remember, I love you, and we'll see you at the next one. Bye.